This is Siddharth Alwalia. Welcome to the 100x Entrepreneur Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Prime Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund led by Amit Somani, Shripati Acharya and Sanjay Swami. Prime is often the first institutional investor in category creating tech startups in fintech, SaaS, healthcare and education such as Mygate, Neo and Reco. To know more about Prime, visit primevp.in. Today I have with me Jay Prakash Vijayan, founder and CEO of Techion Corp. Jay, welcome to the podcast. Thank you Siddharth, glad to be here. Looking forward to a great conversation with you. Jay, first of all, congratulations, you know, you took Techion to a unicorn status. You know, that's an amazing feat for a founder. Thank you. Thank you Siddharth for the wishes. Yeah, it's a um, I think it's a yeah, great milestone. Um, definitely something we all um, feel good about. But um, for me, um, always, uh, you know, I, the way I, I think is it's a great feeling on top of it when, uh, you know, a um, lot of money brings a lot of power, a lot of power brings a lot of responsibility. So I feel now I have a lot more responsibility on our shoulders to deliver and then continue to scale and grow. Yeah, I remember that's a quote from the movie Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah, right? Stanley, yeah. Stanley's quote about uh, great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, yes. absolutely. So Jay, I would like to start with, you know, take on journey and then I would go backwards. But first, why did you start take on and who all were the founders along with you in take on journey? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, the purpose of starting um, just my seed idea of potentially starting a company has been there for a very long time with me. And it probably, I would say, solidified a bit when I was at Oracle. Uh, I used to be in the Oracle engineering uh, product development teams, uh, developing ERP, Oracle ERP. And that was where I felt, you know, ERPs can be much more simpler. It doesn't have to be this complex. It doesn't have to be this boring. It can be fun, similar to um, any consumer app that we, we use and feel good about day to day. But uh, I don't think many people feel good about using their business app or ERP. It's just a chore. So I, that was my first uh, thought process, seed idea of starting. Um, of course, I didn't have the name and other things. Nothing uh, was there, but uh, seed idea of starting the company. And it continued and I had a phenomenal journey in um, VMware, right from IPO to its growth period. And I saw in real world how a large fast growing company like VMware is spending its efforts and time to implement a large ERP like Oracle, right? They spent like hundreds of millions of dollars. It was a massive project. They had a failed project before. And after that, um, I joined the, the second time to lead, to turn around uh, the second time mm, the same project was reinitiated and they named it as Project Phoenix and brought it to life and we successfully of course uh, went live and i saw a real world like you know what how much companies are spending time and effort to do these things and again i felt you know there could be there is a better way to do these things and then tesla was a phenomenal opportunity um, to understand i never had any automotive experience prior to that after joining of course all of all of it was uh, high tech prior and then once i joined tesla of course, Tesla is a very unique company, um, not a very typical automotive company. So there was a um, lot of learning. I had to literally drink from the fire hose about everything, learning um, about automotive world, uh, how automotive uh, processes work. I was uh, fortunate uh, to hire a phenomenal team in a, in a crazy short timeline. And then finally mm, brought everything together uh, i would say had an opportunity to bring elon's vision to life uh, in a very short time frame and then once we did that that's when i saw a stark difference in the traditional automotive world uh, how complicated things are uh, you know automotive is um, four percent of us gdp us gdp is 21 trillion dollars and and uh, 4% is 850 billion dollars uh, just in vehicle transactions vehicle sales and if you consider the entire ecosystem of automotive it is almost a trillion dollar ecosystem that happens every year and still if you see outside of a few exceptions vehicle buying vehicle servicing and vehicle 
and consumer engagement in automotive was uh, very poor and very backward. And I felt there is an opportunity to really deliver a platform to elevate that experience for this trillion dollar economy just in the US. And we have as global aspirations. So you can think about the potential of um, what it could serve and what type of business we could bring um, and continue to develop. And that's the premise of starting Techion. We felt this is an opportunity worth um, going and developing and putting our efforts and time. And clearly, there was a lot of barriers to go through, but we felt this is worth the cost to go build that company. And that is the premise of starting Techion. Wonderful. And can you share like certain milestones in your Techion journey? Yeah. Like when when did you form the company? Mm-hmm. When did you launch the first product? Yeah. What were the few challenges you faced? Because it's it's like a hundred year old industry, more than hundred year old industry, which you are yeah. trying to change. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah, good question, uh, Siddharth. So Techion, we formed the company in uh, early 2016. Okay. Um, and then from that time onwards, um, I started with my personal money in Techion uh, seed money. And then immediately there were few, uh, there was one venture firm, Storm Ventures, which is a pretty solid uh, venture firm. And I had a friend who was a VC and um, he was very interested um, in investing in whatever I do, which was a very nice um, feeling for an entrepreneur when you have someone saying, Jay, whatever you do, I want to be uh, investing in it. Um, so uh, that was a great opportunity. And then friends and family, I, I had some very clear parameters. So one good thing is luckily for me, I've been investing in companies, um, for, I would say somewhere between 10 to 12 years now, um, different companies, different sizes of companies. So I felt I had an opportunity to learn through that process, being advisor, mentor, sometimes on board and public company boards. So I had this opportunity to learn throughout that process. So I was, um, we were making very disciplined um, uh, decisions. Oh, by the way, I forgot to answer your earlier question. You said um, about the co-founders. Um, I want to mention um, there were uh, two key people who, um, joined me immediately after i would consider them as co-founders uh, guru sankararaman um, he was uh, also a vp uh, at tesla with me um, and then anand ramakoti i think these are uh, two key people who um, came about and um, continued the journey with me and they're phenomenal contributors to the success uh, growth and success of uh, techion now uh, going back to your um, uh, you know the continuing the um, uh, other question so we kind of took that uh, journey in early days uh, from uh, 2016 onwards we started developing the first mvp product um, at that time we knew what we wanted to do but what we wanted to do was literally like boiling the ocean for that particular industry because the platform what we had in vision was true ERP for automotive and automotive retail. Literally, it needs to have um, traditional ERP functionalities like, you know, managing inventory, vehicle inventory, parts inventory, you know, supply chain, uh, accounting, general ledger, AP, AR, all of the important ones. These are done only by, if you, if you, you know, this industry, well, only by large corporations which are massive like oracle and sap and you know now workday is slowly trying to get there but still a long way to go um, all billion dollar companies exactly like, you know, very all are, yeah very absolutely difficult. several tens of billions of dollars of companies right like oracle and sap are like you know 200 300 billion dollar companies and they've been in existence for I mean, three four decades um so it's uh and five decades i should say very complex space and uh, I would say mm-hmm. highest barrier of entry that you could choose <laughs> exactly exactly there are so many things that could go wrong that's why you won't see too many startups coming and disrupting in this space um, it takes decades to disrupt any space like this so um, and, and I know for sure there are many companies failed so we took that heavy lifting but we had to lay the path the building blocks 
So one thing we decided to do, that's why you wouldn't have seen prior to the, our billion dollar valuation and Series C announcement, you wouldn't have seen a lot of uh, news about Tekion. In fact, we kept it under the wraps for almost three and a half, four years. Uh, for four years, we kept it very, very silent. We didn't want to you know, go ahead and um, um, advertise before we have a good product. So that is the part which I felt um, we, we continue to keep that discipline forward. So we did a Series A. In fact, we, dis we were not going to raise capital or we were not looking for capital. And luckily, we had few VCs, uh, well-known VC brands uh, reached out to us um, at, at that time and telling that, Jay, you know, we came to know from, you know, Silicon Valley is connected. It's a small world. People come to know, even though we kept it very silent, people came to know and then few VCs uh, reached out to me through my connections network and said, can we have a meeting? And we started meeting with them and they were very interested. They said, you know, it's very intriguing, Jay, what you're doing. And then um, we would love to invest. So this is when, you know, the first time I actively talked, of course, even though Storm Ventures invested, uh, it was great. No strings attached, no, no board seat. I was very fortunate that they're still phenomenal supporters for us. Now, bigger VCs, we started talking to them. And this is when you will see differentiations between VCs, right? So some, I, I started noticing this. Some of the VCs were like, you know what? They, as part of the process, even during discussion, they'll start giving me very strong advice. Like, oh, you shouldn't do this. Oh, you should focus on this. You should do a small portion of this. Why are you trying to take on too much and biting too much about this? So some of these things as an entrepreneur for me, uh, it's not, uh, I would say, um, a good alignment. <laughs> I don't want, because I'm clear on what I'm going to do. So I don't yeah. want to someone to come and yes, they can give advice. I appreciate advice. I appreciate all of their experience. But at the end of the day, it's my decision because otherwise they shouldn't be even investing. If I'm focusing on the, if they, if they think I'm focusing on the wrong thing, they shouldn't be investing. The nice thing, luckily, we have a few other investors and the investor who finally who led the uh, Series A was Index Ventures. And they were absolutely phenomenal. From the first meeting, I, I, can, I could see the alignment. Um, you know, how humble and nice. I mean, Mike Wolpe, who's on my board, I mean, super accomplished guy. He has invested in like, you know, so many companies like, you know, from um, Dropbox to Slack to Confluence, um, Kafka, Elasticsearch, some of the coolest tech companies. And he's also, uh, he was also on the board of uh, Fiat Chrysler and Ferrari, which is an automotive company, which is very aligned for me. And for me, it was a no brainer. And the way he approached and um, how he understood what we were trying to solve. And that was a very clear alignment and we decided to go with index ventures as our lead for series a and then we continued the journey what happened after that was of course we created a um, mvp product in um, 2017 the first version of the product itself and we had a very clear path he said you know we are trying to boil the ocean but at least let's make sure that we don't you know sit and waste time for years because the market would have moved and i, I had a very clear path on what we wanted to do so we said, you know, let's start focusing on the first area to roll out a version of the product to um, our customers, paying customers, and then let's start the feedback loop. We're going to learn a lot more. So our team, we were lucky to have a lot of dealers who supported. So our team, product and design team spent tons of time at dealerships, in, literally in few dealerships in and around where we live. We had, they've even given, an, given us an office uh, to sit and then OEMs also slowly with the Series A investment, XR came in, which is the parent company of uh, Fiat, Chrysler and Ferrari. So we started conversation with some OEMs. But during this process, a few things uh, found was the industry was so backward. The processes were, uh, I would say, extraordinarily bureaucratic. So um, the simplest example I could give is the first version of MVP when we got the product ready, um, the version one, uh, we called it as digital service experience, um, focused on vehicle service, solving the problem only for vehicle service. Um, and we went and demoed to um, dealers and quite a few dealers and dealers saw that and they all wowed. They said, you know, product is great. This is exactly what we've been looking for. Um, this is a leapfrog of, you know, everything that is uh, out here. 
So we would love to become a, your become your customer. Then they also said, you know, unfortunately, we will lose a few compliance requirements from the OEM. Basically, they have to certify your product before you roll out to our dealerships. I said, okay, we'll see that that's a longer process. I know OEMs because of the, the nature of how big they are, it takes time for them to do anything. So for a startup, as you know, well, every month you're burning cash if you don't have revenue. So I, I don't have the runway to have a discussion with an OEM. It takes a year, two years, three years to get certification with OEMs because they move really slow. I started engaging with the OEMs and first, uh, you know, they wouldn't take meetings. Then I had to push, uh, try to get my connections and at least get a meeting. And luckily with my background, finally, uh, I was able to get meetings. And, you know, meetings would go the, like this. We'll do a demo, complete walkthrough of the prototype in a pilot uh, dealerships. There are a couple of dealerships who are very brave to roll out the product. And they said, you know what, it's fine. We'll support you. And even if we... Mm, uh, are not fully compliant we may lose some you know credits or money but we'll do it and and thanks to them and we will show the full demo um oem teams would come they would see it there will be a dozen people in the room they'll say wow okay good great product everything is good but unfortunately you know we have process we have rules and we can't really break them it takes a long time for anything to get done we can't get it done like the way you think on top of it the final the punchline was you know uh, we we won't engage with any any company until they have like you know at least 50 or 100 minimum 100 dealerships on the platform so for me it was like oh my god that was a shock like how how does this happen it's like a chicken and egg problem i can't even roll out to one customer one dealer if the oems don't certify and oems are saying i can't even talk to you if you don't have at least 100 dealerships so it was a, a problem that I needed to solve. Um, how, how, how am I going to break this? And it was a bit, quite a bit disappointing for me, especially as a founder, like where, where does the product go from here? Because we spent so much time and effort. So that was a point where we had to, these are barriers that we had to make. This is just one example. There are like so many intertwined old way of doing things. They didn't even realize what, what kind of, uh, a roadblock and uh, you know concrete walls they have built around themselves and for innovation to happen so uh, i had to slowly break through that and some of the times it had to it, it, we had to do different kinds of things so one of the things was lucky i was lucky to get um, a demo going for one of the top leaders in one of the uh, topmost oems which has invested in us the president of that company um, and one of the dealer created that FaceTime for me to show a demo. And then he was very impressed. Still, things didn't move. So finally, I had to send a strong email to him in a nice way, polite but strong email to say, you know, why they are literally curbing innovation. And in spite of everyone feeling, including their dealers, including their team, feeling this is an innovative product, why are you blocking um, this are not really him, but saying the processes what you've created over decades are literally putting barriers. And I said, you know, if innovation need to happen and if you need to be relevant for today and the future, we need to break this barrier. And that started opening doors. So once one OEM started opening doors, then few dealers came in. So it was a cycle. I'm just shortening it for, for you. It was a process that we went through um, over a couple of years and the first two years uh, were the toughest then we started getting customers one by one and then we um, continue to enhance put the development going so then our um, series b happened so what happened during series b was the product first version was launched we had a few paying customers then we um, started getting interest from a um, couple of VCs. Then I also felt it's the right time to, you know, raise capital. I started pitching to few, uh, quite a few other VCs as well. So it was a good combination of experience, similar to our Series A. Series B was a little bit uh, um, lengthier process where, you know, same problem. Some of the VCs were extraordinarily binary. You know, uh, when I say binary, because I've been on both sides, you know, investing, 
as well as um, on the entrepreneurial side yes investment is for getting a return but at the same time important to understand what the entrepreneur is trying to solve so many vcs were super binary they they won't try to understand the industry they won't try to understand as much they will have an opinion and they'll immediately do only binary calculation of like okay if you do this if you do this you only you can do this much and i don't think there is too many barriers to this so it was a combination of experience and then on, and, and we still got a couple of strong interests from vcs and luckily that's when couple more institutions came in um you know alliance ventures which is nissan renault mitsubishi alliance um they from an institution point of view they gave a term sheet to lead our series b around the same time immediately after alliance bmw gave a term sheet as well bmw ventures so which was nice for me so i just wanted to ask for the listeners like if you can share the quantum of series a series b because yeah it, yeah it's really difficult to understand like what what was the amount what was the valuation i think yeah yeah i can share so series uh, you know um, a was uh, we raised 10 million um, at around 48 million dollars post value yeah and then um, series b we um, ended up raising so i'll talk about series b now so series b we had vc vc interests we had institutions which is alliance and bmw to lead and of course in the best interest of the company we are solving a larger problem for the industry so i wanted as many oem brands to be part of this journey and that was a very thoughtful decision because in the past for companies which had failed i had seen that one of the biggest thing is not getting the oem connection and integration uh, and support on time so i felt you know this is important for us so we worked with both alliance and bmw and requested them can you come together so they did which was great um, and initially they were they were a little bit hesitant and because of course they had egos they wanted to do be the lead but finally they they came together and it worked out phenomenally well for everyone and they both co-led my series b and so series b let me think um, was 20 uh, yeah 22 yeah i think it's 22 million if i'm right we raised um, 22 million series b at uh, 90 uh, i think it was 98 million post in terms of valuation got it um yeah and then so this was in year 2019 you are mentioning about series b was uh, in 2018 not 19 okay 2018 2019 there was a series b1 we also did a b1 yeah uh, it was more like an extension very soon it happened general motors uh, after that you know for a, they've been following us for almost 2 years uh, every 6 months general motors would check in on the progress how we are doing and they've been phenomenal mm. and every 6 months when they see the progress they will get blown away they're like wow okay you guys have made phenomenal progress so almost uh, two two plus years they were checking on us and then they said you know what it's about time now we need to be part of this so you guys have made tons of progress so their exact words um one of the top executives um his words were jay what you and your team have made as a progress in 18 months um literally one and a half years we have been following companies praying that they will make progress um companies that we have been following for 15 years and they couldn't even scrape the surface the amount of progress you guys have made is phenomenal that will definitely help transform this industry so they came in and came around and then finally they led the series b1 and then all of our investors followed and supported so we raised a b1 of 30 million dollars um and that was a great round as well all of our round were pretty much um oversubscribed um for all good reasons and again we were very very disciplined on you know dilution you know board and all of those so that is our series uh, b1 and then we continued our path we formed a great partnership with general motors and then the biggest thing is now with the capital we went full force in developing a complete comprehensive platform we accelerated our development process to make sure that the full end to end platform comes together so that was um i think it was a not a easy decision because multiple times over 
we multiple people invested even in our board some of the board members not very strongly but advice telling that no why do you want to do build something like accounting it's very complex and a lot of things can go wrong because companies like oracle and sap have been doing this for decades and why don't you partner with some other company and this right and i think it's i should say fortunately um we tried looked at that and none of them there was anywhere alignment because um you know i already knew how these companies how in oracle or sap good companies but not for you know smaller companies they are enterprise software the people spend tons of money time and effort um but we needed a product that could scale for even one dealership or 100 dealership um or 1000 dealerships um on the on the cloud it should be simple and easy and there is no product that was out there i found a big gap in the industry you know there are smaller products like you know quickbooks zero it's a small business products then there are large products which is oracle and you know sap and you know even netsuite but there was no product that is in between all of these slightly bigger businesses mid sized businesses um there is no good product out there and there were a lot of vertical products small small ones but there was no good end to end platform so that was a gap i found and then i felt like you know what we have to go develop this there is no other way and people did scare us quite a few people said this could go wrong big time all your other areas that you are trying to solve in automotive will get impacted if you try to do all of these together but i was convinced you know what this is this is worth the effort if we are solving it let's solve it comprehensive we don't want to be one other point solution in 100 different solutions that is already existing out there which is creating friction so we went ahead and developed the complete end to end platform and thanks to my phenomenal team i mean they pulled this off like i i i mean i've done this for 25 years i have not seen any team and i don't think any team will be able to do that anytime in the near future so we brought that whole platform what we call it as automotive retail cloud we officially launched this in 2019 late 2019 very successfully and then we did pilots across the country as well that way we were a very thoughtful process to run pilots in partnership with general motors we chose dealers in different parts of the country you know west coast in california in southern in florida then in uh, new york and connecticut so so that we are preparing for a scale we didn't want to do things easy right of course sometimes it's easy to do easy <laughs> you go choose something yeah. but you you can't scale later properly so we wanted to make sure that we do take that heavy lifting and plan it properly and do a pilot that where we can scale across the country i think all of the hard work paid off we started getting a lot more traction tons more interest from oems and from dealers and that's when you know uh we got interest from a few large vc and private equity firms and then advent reached out through um, um one of my connection uh, ex tesla john mcneil who also joined my board and we started talking to them in fact they were so interested that they again similar to our series a we hit it off in the first meeting the managing partner eric was blown away I mean he was jumping out of his seat as we started showing the product demo. He was like, "Oh my god, wow, you guys did develop this much." And he said, "You guys solved this problem and this because he has studied the industry for almost 10 years and he knew the problems existed in the industry. It's very tough and that is honestly it's it's like a gift for an entrepreneur. When you get an investor who's aligned, first they need to put an effort to understand the industry. It looks like he has already done that for several years and then second they need to believe you know your vision and you're solving the right problem and then final thing is you and your team are the right team to solve that problem i think that alignment was there instantly i went came in and said you know what please stop talking to anyone else we would love to do this for you um around because we know this industry and we know we can partner and we know you guys are doing going to do great and that's how advent partnership happened everything happened super quick uh, we were thrilled to um get the valuation that we got like crossed a billion dollar because our revenue has been growing 
um, significantly. And uh, yeah, uh, here we go. And the dilution also was very, um, very small, as you could see, imagine we didn't share exactly what the valuation is, but it's significantly more than a billion. So we raised 150. So it's, it's a very uh, fantastic round in all, all aspects. We had all of our investors participate. We had some great new investors um, come in as well, like a company called FM Capital, which had top 100 dealers in the country. XR, which is uh, the parent company of Fiat Chrysler and Ferrari, they participated again. So, yeah, of course, we had to, unfortunately, we had to say no to a few uh, people nicely. And, uh, you know, everyone overall was extraordinarily supportive. So we are thrilled uh, to get the capital uh, that we received. Now we are set for that big scale that we are working towards. That's wonderful. And Jay, uh, you know, uh, that would have been at least, I think, four to five X jump in valuation from the last round, which was, you know, I think series C. <laughs> I didn't share the B1. B1, our valuation was 180. So we kind of yeah. doubled from B to B1. And yeah. from B1 to this, like you said, yeah, it's a 6x um, jump. Amazing. And Jay, if you could also please share, you know, just some rough numbers about around, you know, what's the current ARR and how has the ARR grown over the years or the number of users or the dealerships have grown per year from 2017 till now? Yeah. Um, so if you see 2017-18 was purely prototype product. We um, That was a conscious decision. We didn't go full force to market. We didn't have a sales team um, hired. So we were very clear to it was more testing the market and making sure that we get feedback loop into the company. I would consider our automotive retail cloud launch uh, in, in um, 2019, even though officially we, we launched the pilots a few months early. But once we confirmed the pilots are solid, uh, then we officially did a press release in November 2019. That's the official, I would say, uh, launch. And until then, the revenue was small. Uh, but in 2020, it immediately jumped to um, almost, uh, it started going towards, and then now we are more in double digit uh, ARR. We have not shared uh, the ARR numbers, uh, Siddharth, to anyone. So I'm not sharing the exact numbers. We will share sometime in the future. Yeah? So from a um, uh, presence perspective, we are already in a short time frame from last <laughs> November to this number is not even right. It's tomorrow. Uh, we haven't even completed one year. So less than one year, we are already we have customers in 28 states in the uh, United States and growing rapidly. And it's it's great, phenomenal already. We already have integrated with 17 OEM brands, you know, including some other top ones, uh, you know, General Motors and um, Fiat Chrysler. Um, there are quite a few. All the Fiat Fiat brands. So 17 brands we have uh, already integrated. The transaction volume already in, on our platform crossed $350 million and continuing to rapidly grow. Uh, these are just aggregate numbers for you to you know, see the scale. Uh, already you know, 25,000 plus vehicles have been sold using our platform. More than 160,000 vehicles serviced on the platform. Um, almost a million parts sold on the platform. So we are rapidly making um, traction and progress uh, and growth. From a growth point of view, I see us growing from year over year uh, in 2021, at least 200% or more. Um, that's our growth trajectory. And at that scale, I feel it's a solid growth and we will continue to grow um, significantly over the next few years. And yeah, if you could share, you know, what the advantage the end customer, the buyer of the car has got through the massive technology and scale that you have built. Yeah, I think the more, most important one for us, right? That's uh, that's uh, that's everything. You know, end of the day, if we do that right, in which we are, mm, then everything else will follow. So as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, how big the automotive retail economy is yes. it's a trillion dollar economy just in the us and if you take outside the us and global um, it's probably somewhere around like four to five trillion dollars um, across the board so it's a huge economy people buying and selling cars people servicing and maintaining their cars you know 
from Techion perspective, you know, so before starting there, right, you know, today's process is frictionful. Buying a car has a lot of friction. Um, many times online yeah. buying, people say that it's just for the namesake. Uh, you know, some companies do an okay job in selling used cars online, but the new car um, yeah. selling is quite complex, right? It's it's fraught with friction due to multiple reasons. Even regulations create frictions. But on top of it, the biggest friction point right now is the fragmentation. In this industry, if you think about, if you take a dealer, when you walk into yeah. a dealer in the in the US. Even if you have done all your homework and know exactly which car you're going to buy, they will make you sit anywhere between four to six to eight hours in the dealership. And it is many times a very painful experience. I have gone through this myself, um, buying a car um, a few years ago. Um, it is a tough experience, not a pleasurable experience. Unfortunately, as you know, well, car buying is the most of the time is the largest value buying after your house it's big purchase and yeah. people do it a few second times biggest expenditure exactly second biggest house. exactly yeah. expenditure after the house and many times people do it like once in their lifetime and of course sometimes they do a few times in their lifetime but it's an important purchase but if you that purchase should be a pleasurable experience all of the friction can be removed so if you see in a dealership even if you're buying in a dealership or buying online and then going into a dealership you would see the dealership employee opening 9, 10, 11, 12 different windows to close your um, deal because he has to do everything from desking a deal, what they call it. It's not done in the DMS many times. Desking a deal to create you know, your payment and calculation and all of those things. Then finance and insurance is a different application many times. Credit application is a different application many times. There are so many touch points. And what happens is it creates more drag in the experience and it takes away transparency. They have to rekey in information. They make mistakes. Online selling tools, like uh, the reason I say that is there are decent tools out there, but unfortunately they don't solve the problems comprehensively. Basically the online tools and then the in-store tools talk different language. Um, so in what I'm saying is calculations are different. So when you yeah. try to place an order, you will see some numbers in terms of your fee, taxes and calculations. But at the end of the day, for namesake, you press complete. But someone in the dealership has to call you and tell you many times saying, sorry, the number you saw, dollar number is not accurate because... The systems that run in the back end, which is typically called as DMS, done, doesn't talk the same language. So it's a lot more friction points. So anyway, bottom line, goal for automotive retail cloud is to completely eliminate this friction. The core journey of consumer buying, selling, servicing and maintaining a car and the engagement pieces all come together in one platform seamlessly. And solving this problem comprehensively is what we are doing with Automotive Retail Cloud. So this trillion dollar economy, we are trying to make sure that it is frictionless. Um, it is very simple, easy for everyone. And it should be as simple as what you're going through buying a car or buying any product, you know, in online, in Amazon or some of the easiest way of the consumer experience. So that is the biggest picture what we are solving. We are taking the complexity to our system you know end of the day for me when you when, when you step back and think computers are designed for taking complexity crunching them and giving simplicity to the end user right so mm -hmm. that's exactly what we are trying to do using the best of technology to bring it together and take all of the complexity out we solve all the complexity in our platform and provide the consumer journey simple easy to use and for all of the users who are dealership users could be oems making things simple and intuitive and provide the right things so that we don't have them remember 200 things to sell a car or to service a car right so we are ironing this whole process out using machine learning and ai to enable them to do the best everything sell the right product sell the right services all of those are missed out today and that's what we are solving so the biggest thing is 
creating that platform, bringing OEMs, dealers, and consumers all much closer, create transparency and trust, and making that consumer journey seamless. And does it also result in, apart from convenience, any cost saving for the end customer? Oh, massive. Uh, everyone. Um, everyone in the ecosystem saves massive amount of money. So if you go to our website, there are some early case studies numbers we have shared. How much, see, in addition to running a state-of-the-art platform, frictionless process, it is a massive saving. So here's what I'll give you some examples. Today, in dealerships in the US, they run 40, 50 different applications. They pay crazy amount of money. Uh, some dealerships pay almost $100,000 a month in software cost per, per dealership. Not It's not even yeah. so hard. So think about all the cost overhead they are passing on. Many times these will be passed on to the customer, right? Because they need yeah. to run a business. They need to do margins. So it is, we are completely removing these friction and cost savings also significant. In addition to not only cost savings, so three, three big value propositions, right? So one, the best consumer experience and personalized using ML and AI providing personalized consumer experience throughout consumer journey. It doesn't matter whether they do it from their phone, from their laptop, from desktop, when they drive to the dealership, when they sit in the dealership, all connected personalized experience, number one. Number two, on top of this state-of-the-art um, platform, significant amount of cost savings. Um, massive, there are dealerships that save anywhere between 15000 to you know $65,000 a month by moving to our platform. Okay, That is um, kind of number two. Number three is also important. We are increasing sales. Using our ML and AI, we are providing both to consumers as well as to the dealers and OEMs the right recommendation. See, today, it is a manual process. And it's people-based, you know, salesperson tries to upsell and cross-sell. Some There are great salespeople who are able to do it. But, you know, it's it doesn't build trust. Many times when someone sells it to someone else, sometimes they also sell things that the customer doesn't want. They force it and sell it. Then what happens to the customer satisfaction? The customer feels really horrible okay. that, you know, yeah, exactly. They feel like, you know, they took advantage of me and, you know, I paid for something that I didn't want. But... If you think about the same thing when someone goes online and purchases something, we, you know, spontaneously keep buying in Amazon or whatever tool because we keep clicking and buying because the reason there, the friction is not there. And then as extreme the transparency. Exactly. Extreme transparency. And final thing is you make the decision. See, end of the day, no one is forcing you. So you don't feel guilty. Even if you feel guilty, you just shove it uh, underneath and say, oh, no, end of the day, it's fine, right? I'm okay <laughs> because you made the decision. So that's what we are trying to do with our ML engine. Throughout the consumer journey, we are creating transparency. We give them the price. We, we tell them, you know, this is why you may like this product because you have this vehicle make model trim. 80% of the customers who are using this are using this. And by the way, the benefit of this is, you know, say, for example, using an air filter will improve your vehicle environment and pollen counts are higher, right? Whatever. Yeah. So the real giving them the real data and transparency to say why potentially they may be interested or buying this. And same thing for the dealer as well. So when they when, when a consumer comes in, we show to the dealer employees telling that, you know what, these are the products that the customers might be interested. Rather than you shoving something to them because you might get a commission, you better propose these products, they will like it and you will still get a commission. So it's kind of a win-win situation. Um, we felt that's an opportunity. So these are the three value propositions that we bring uh, via our platform, which creates a win-win-win opportunity uh, for this ecosystem. So, so if I'm not wrong, like in future two, three years or five years, your AI and ML, which you have built and taken on, will take away the jobs of a salesperson from a dealership? You know, um, I don't. I don't see that we can. It can. It it can reduce. Uh, you know, the number of people needed because at the end of the day, it will create more jobs in different areas. Because you know, today we are just adding friction. If you think about Amazon, people can say you know it has taken away um, you know jobs, but it's also created tons of jobs because it has its own warehouse and supply chain. There are like you know hundreds and thousands of people who work there. And then delivery, all of those. 
So I don't see that because people still, uh, we have created one more thing in our platform, which is unique. I don't think it exists in the industry where we have created a hybrid experience. If you are going through an online purchasing, you could start clicking through buying a car online, but any moment in that flow, you could suddenly decide, you know, I don't want to, or you can decide, or you can look at and say, you know, I don't see few variations or options for my car online. So now you're kind of stuck. If you, you don't want to go to a dealership, you want to do it online, but at the same time, you want some help. So one click, we have created a virtual handshake. So literally one click, they can initiate a virtual session to the dealership. A dealership staff can answer that session and create a virtual handshake. They can do a screen sharing session on the browser. They don't have to download another app. They don't have to do anything. They can do a screen sharing and the dealership staff can walk them through and say, by the way, you know what? Um, we have this option. So, okay, you have this alternative and we have this discount. And they can literally annotate um, on the screen and share both sides. They can share videos and pictures. So we do a virtual handshake and this becomes a hybrid um, option where I think there is a need for this, right? Not everyone will be able to see everything online. So this creates a good experience for the consumer, a good uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, sales cycle for the dealership. And then they complete the, the deal and the car can be delivered or the consumer can come and pick it up at the dealership. So, um, yeah, we, we have created multiple options where um, I think they, they can maintain that relationship for very long term. Got it. Oh, wonderful. What you have created is truly industry transformational. And it's one of those products we see in a decade that truly transforms the 100-year-old industry. Like how often do we get to see this kind of a transformation, Jay? Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I think that's our... We are thrilled about this. Again, we have a um, lot more work to do uh, in terms of you know scaling and taking this um, to the next steps and also taking this global. Jay, so I wanted to touch upon, you know, what made Jay Vijayan of today, who is the CEO and founder of Techion? Like, so, so first I wanted to ask, do you categorize yourself among the geniuses of Elon Musk? Like, would you call yourself a genius? Absolutely no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> Why is I'm, that? I'm, I, I know, honestly, I, I, I feel, um, the, the way I'll strongly feel, everyone has genius in them. Um, all, I would say almost everyone, okay? Um, it's about how do you tap that out? I mean, people like Elon Musk have, have done that in an extraordinary way. And I don't, I don't compare uh, to um, Elon or, you know, um, Steve Jobs or anyone like that, right? Um, it is me and I came from a very, very normal background. It's kind of life's learnings over a period of time, over decades. I, I, I think it's about combination of two things. You have to tap in your inner genius and every everyone can do that. Um, it's purely about putting your, your mind and the right effort, keeping the right mindset of learning throughout the process, um, throughout your journey. A couple of things which I felt which helped me do what I'm doing is every step you learn, take life lessons every step in your personal life in your career i learned every step uh, every job of mine from very early days i applied the prior learnings and make it better apply the prior one make it better so from oracle time i think vmware helped phenomenally because it was a very fast paced growth company grew from 200 million to you know 5 billion in revenue 50 billion in market cap growth brought very high paced and a lot of you'd say to some extent even chaos and on an organized chaos we went through that built it and up that helped me do what i was able to do at tesla and then of course all i learned from tesla including working with elon some phenomenal lessons and the visibility i had in the company how many barriers tesla broke uh, to uh, achieve what they are achieving today and yeah. those all I'm applying in, in Techion, not just that, but in my other world as well, in my investment world, the learnings I went through with other startups. That's why we were able to set things in the right way. I think, I think the important thing is, you know, um, you, you have to be, as an entrepreneur, I think that learning process is important, both successes and failures. 
one of the yeah. things I keep telling to people is uh, my, in my, my team, as well as even my kids, I tell is, you know, you, your lifetime will not be enough to learn only from your mistakes. So you have to learn from other people's mistakes. Yeah. It could be observing, it could be reading books, it could be, you know, multiple things that you could do. So that's, I think it's a learning process for me. And I would say I'm nowhere to a uh, genius. I still have work, a lot more learning to do. Again, life is, uh, I think, I would say, never-ending learning. And you have to keep that mind open. Um, it's like, you know, um, only if you have uh, some level of emptiness, you can keep filling. If you feel you're already full, then you can't, you can't yeah. put anything in, right? So that's, a, that's, that's kind of I feel who I am. And, and Jay, I would love to know about your schedule from the time you wake up to the time you sleep. What, what are the activities that go in? Yeah, um, I'll share. You know, it's again, that is another part of learning. Um, early days, I was all about, I used to, I like working out a lot. Um, I've done all kinds of things from very young age. Some days I'll wake up at like, you know, 4 a.m. to go for a run and all of those. So it was all over the place. Um, last few years, I've settled down. I read a lot, um, all kinds of books and self-improvement books and, you know, all of those. I think it's important for any leader and especially an entrepreneur. Um, it's very, very important to be self-centered and uh, read a lot about all of these. And when you read a lot, you'll always find this common theme. There's no one book that is a holy grail or one you know video that's a holy grail. So you have to get themes and you will find a common theme and common thread in many of these things. Um, so my routines have changed. So now morning routine mm, for me becomes... Um, I get up, you know, um, whatever time I go to bed, I try to get up early, like around anywhere between 5.30 to 6. If I go really late, then I change my alarm to, you know, 6 or 6.15 or something like that. But if I go um, a bit early, my bedtime varies every day. And it's unfortunate, but I try to get anywhere between, trying to get to bed anywhere between 10 to 12. It used to be 1, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., all kinds of crazy. But now I'm trying to get to bed between 10 to 12 in the night get up 5 30 to 6 in the morning and then the moment i get up uh, i have a few morning routines uh, you know you quickly um you know brush and then i have uh, um, uh, breathing exercises i do um which is like for 30 minutes i do some i've learned a few breathing exercises and recently uh, started um, you know reading different books about there is a book recently i read phenomenal book called as breath uh, the uh, the last signs um, last yeah last signs of uh, human art or something like that I think the extension of the title phenomenal book and then I started following the Wim Hof breathing method as well so I started doing the breathing exercises which is great and really really gives a good uh, fresh start and then I do some workout I have some tea and I morning I start with some you know fruits is, is something that is really light and then i do some light workout for another 30 minutes then yeah your day is you know much more brisk and i just get into calls emails work and you know with covid things have changed <laughs> we're we all stuck to a room and zoom all the time and then um I, I think the balance is important for all all of us i think one suggestion for me that works is Try to take that outlet a little bit. It could be, you know, during the day as well. Like, you know, it could be 15 minutes walk um, outside. It could be, you know, music. It could be TV. So you always need that uh, small, small outlet and break uh, that uh, that helps. And then otherwise, it's all business throughout the day. Nights is when I changed also a small routine that helped me significantly. Otherwise, I was carrying too much stress in the night, like where I was always thinking about, you know, how many problems. You always have problems to solve with respect to who it is, big or small. And one other thing that helped me in the night is, you know, um, I tried, you know, meditation and other things, but now I do meditation in the morning with the breathing exercises. But in the night, uh, I started reading books. So my reading time is always in the night. I don't do in between. Before going to bed, I go to bed with the candle in my hand to most part. And that is uh, helped significantly take your mind off and usually read books that are, you know, interesting to you. Mm, it doesn't have to be always work-related and subject-related. You can read that, but I think I usually try to take something that is outside of my work related that is something interesting it could be anything food and it could be 
yoga, it could be breathing, it could be, you know, uh, surfing, it could be anything, but just something that is uh, outside of work. I think that's my routine. It helped me significantly um, take the mind off and you have whatever number of hours you sleep, you have a, a peaceful. One of the things I've learned, um, it's uh, always continuing to, even, even though you know it's, it is surprising is human capability. What we have, when you, early days, the belief systems also change, right? You always you read everywhere you need, you know, eight hours sleep, 10 hours sleep, six hours sleep, doesn't matter. I think each person is different. I think each person's capability is also much higher than what we think. So when you go through, learn, and you can always stretch everything a little bit, little bit, little bit, you try what is your capability, and you'll be surprised most of the time, both mind, uh, body, both. And, and Jay, uh, uh, one thing which I wanted to ask, like you could have always settled for good, like, you know, uh, you, you, you come from Chennai, and you pushed yourself, like really pushed yourself, and I think you you went to Oman for a while. Correct. For a yes. job in software engineering. Yes, correct. And you did NIT courses to learn software engineering. Correct. Then then you pushed yourself to learn Oracle database, which which was certification, which was I think not really common at that point in time. And then then you landed a job at Oracle, which which could have been comfortable, and you could have easily retired there, but you still pushed yourself went into VMware in a chaotic environment or reached a very senior director level position there and you are like with stocks and everything you could have been comfortable but you still took a pay cut and after one year of you know uh, pondering over you joined Tesla at a pay cut but uh, you know once uh, you 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 had some good amount of stocks and when you were coming out of Tesla, like today, you could have easily retired for your lifetime yes. with the Tesla stocks you <laughs> yes. had. Yes. yes. But, but you still pushed yourself, you know. So where does this, you know, drive to push come from? Like it's not easy. Right? Yeah. To, to bring you from Chennai to Oman to Singapore <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks. Uh, um, uh, so that good, good question. So the way I saw, you know, honestly, every part of, I'll be very honest, uh, every part of this, what you mentioned, there is always one part of me telling me, okay, you know what, this is the time to settle down. Let's be in the comfort zone, um, in, which was there because even in Oracle, after, because it was seven and a half years, I felt, you know, I was uh, being in the comfort zone. But at the same time, somehow being in the comfort zone always gives you a little bit of uncomfort as well because you feel you know bored you feel that you know you're not doing a lot you're not learning a lot see one of the things um, i've mentioned in other podcasts which uh, in the past and i believe so as well um, you then the the way the world works and the, the the way the human nature works is also when you break out of a resistance you get stronger and you grow bigger right you can take the fundamentals of uh, uh, planting a seed into the ground and the seed grows out of the ground and as you water the some of the times that's why not all but many of the seeds it won't grow um, just outside the ground you have to you know dig a hole and close it and then you water it and then it kind of breaks out and grows right that's why there's a saying that i think this is i steal from jim quicks um, uh, saying where you know um uh, taking an egg when you know the shell is broken from inside uh, life uh, begins and when it's broken from outside uh, life ends um, so if you see those fundamental principles even like you know how uh, uh, kind of the a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and then breaks out slowly to become a butterfly. You may know that concept of if you take out a butterfly uh, or the uh, the the, um, cat, the the bu butterfly before its formation inside or outside of a cocoon, if you cut it using a scissor or just leave, let let it out by itself, even in the late stage, sometimes it won't even survive because it won't grow the strength in its wings to fly because the strength grows while it was trying to break that cocoon around it. So the point is, you your mental and physical, um, I think, um, growth, strength, 
grows when you grow out of your go out of your comfort zone uh, to expand yourself then you feel good about it there is always an initial phase of getting out of the comfort zone that is the toughest part you feel like you know do i need to do this everything is going well why should i take uh, this uh, for, right and that was in my mind as well but i think i was able to break through that and just think about in the past telling that wow okay you know what i went through tough times but i came out well i came out better as a better person stronger person more learning all of those so any all the time there are few people thought i was crazy like why are you even doing this you know um life is good even when i left tesla there are a lot of people thought like are you literally crazy in fact uh, i was fine my wife didn't sleep for 6 months when i left my job at tesla because how many how much money i left and people thought how much uh, you know trust i established with elon while it not it was not working out that great for so many people i had in a, such a good position but then i felt you know, you know this is about time i i did in very high intense uh, job i delivered what tesla needed to and in fact i told this to elon as well and i said i told him when i met him he said um, jay what about you know potentially he was kind of indicating can you kind of come back but when um, i told him uh, it is a bit boring for me <laughs> i said uh, i did what you wanted me to deliver it was fun it was interesting for you know 2 3 years but now becomes a routine so i feel i'm kind of in a place where you know uh, i may have to do i want to do something different um so yes i think that part is important for all of us my advice is going to be um push out of that comfort zone uh, not like you know um, without calculations but to have a, always take a calculated risk but definitely move out of the comfort zone to do the next do the next do the next right it's a the reason why we do what we do in terms of reading books to expand our mind doing workout to expand our muscles it's all the same principle you have to keep keep doing that's why um movement brings um growth and strength if you don't do the reverse is not even staying stagnant the reverse is shrinking literally it does shrink okay. yeah okay. exactly okay exactly atrophy right if you don't work out if you be stagnant muscles atrophy basically they really shrink they don't so anyway it's a very philosophical but i think the reason i kind of felt that way is always pushing that a little bit to go to the next go to the next and some other things are external factors as well i had a great support um system family but end of the day it's your call um we have to make that call and make that happen and and jay uh, you mentioned in one of your art, like the very recent articles which came in forbes that uh, when you were in vmware and you were first approached by a senior recruiter at tesla you you almost made up your mind and uh, then it took one year like elon talked to you and then it took one year for elon to convince you to join right um yeah it was slightly different so the way yes the first time mm, i spoke and everything um and i politely declined the offer because it was not attractive enough and, and of course it was the same problem where i had to leave too much money on the table at vmware and tesla couldn't come up with an attractive enough salary uh, and stock and then luckily i should say i'm more lucky that um, they hired someone and it didn't work out and elon kept me in mind and they called me after a year again and this time he felt you know he needs to hire me and i also felt compelled that you know what i missed last time and this time and i need to probably this is an opportunity for me uh, not to miss it anymore so that's kind of how i decided still i i had to take a pay cut purely in a, in a salary and bonus because vmware uh, had me in a really solid salary and great bonus um and that really stopped um almost 100000 uh, dollars just purely from salary cut perspective and then on top of it i had to leave stocks because my monthly stock vesting was much more than my monthly salary um and i had to it was tough because i i mean i didn't come up in a wealthy family so i was paying bank loans <laughs> for <laughs> several years after coming to the us so it was hard earned so i couldn't leave that easily but at the same time you know when you put the cost i felt you know what now it's about time for me to take that jump take that leap of faith take that risk 
and yeah you know what end of the day it's fine money is will will follow and that's my principle has been you know uh, it's not that money is not important it's important but that never should be the primary goal that should be following so if you kind of approach it with the better reasons money will follow so if if you think in hindsight what what was the reason that made elon come back to you after one year the quality which you know you may have so- seen in yourself but you may not have seen in yourself that elon identified that yeah, jay I, is the right guy for this responsibility yeah great uh, great to the great question honestly uh, i think yeah definitely thanks to him uh, because i didn't see as much uh, value in uh, uh, in in uh, i mean i do i'm definitely a self confident person but i also am not very over confident about things so i um, at the same time like i said thanks to him and it's uh, it always takes uh, someone like elon to look into people about their their strengths what they can what can what they can deliver uh, for his his vision um, i think it would be tough for i don't think anyone else would have made that decision that easily because if you think in a typical world and in a brand that is already public company they generally go and hire a cio proven they always go for something proven right um, and it's easy that way uh, people will not try um, i think for me lucky there are a few things he saw in me i i i think so one uh, which, which is aligned to what he was looking for in tesla i had this combination of you know product development and engineering building applications because he wanted someone to build things in house second i had a second uh, combination of um running large enterprise it in a fast growing company vmware grew really fast and he saw that you know i had the growth and the fast during pay, fast pace i was able to build applications and grow um, teams yeah. and organizations and then the final one is of course the chemistry when i when i say chemistry purely he's a very objective person um, he asked me during the interview also you know i had a patent that i had um, filed i think couple of patents at oracle he was uh, definitely drilling down deeper on those things he is a person who will find out whether this person is uh, has done what they are saying they have done so he asked me questions about what did you solve in that uh, you know particular what was the solution and why i explained him why i solved um, that problem and why how big of it is it was for oracle's customers and i found a way to do it um, in uh, collaboration with the with the team there and then this is the reason why we uh, filed it so i think that combination of uh, all of those and there were some generic discussions as well about market and industry how i saw about the future um and i think it's a combination he's a super smart guy and he's also makes decisions very quick it's not that he is right all the times but he's right majority of the time and that's been working out great so yeah i think I, from a qualities perspective i think these are the things that i feel he saw in me which is again big thanks to him and it was uh, it was a phenomenal journey and opportunity for me to um, really and he brought out the even the the best in me at that time and that that helped me to grow further and uh, jay elon is said to drive his team what i have read, read you know in his uh, biography as well as you know various articles and through podcast drive people to insanity like not insanity in a bad term but in a good way uh, like more than 100 hours of work per 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 week right yeah you know for me the way i see it is he is mission driven um he as like you said we talked about geniuses he is a guy who tapped into his inner genius so much and he is extraordinarily driven to accomplish his mission whatever it takes the way i see it is if someone has that grand of a vision that big of a vision solving some massive problems it's tough for them to keep or give mind if i put it this way put give mind space for smaller things um so i am not saying it's people are i mean people's issues and concerns are smaller things but unfortunately the reality is whether we like it or not he doesn't have time 
and it has to be the next level of leaders who have to do that and I, I know it is very tough because he moves with such a pace and how many problems he needs to solve and you need people like that to solve like bigger problems so the way I would do is you know it's a great mission if you don't believe in his mission and of course yes some he does come up with mission impossible targets uh, to people and many times he brings out the best in them and that happened for me I mean, i'd never thought we would pull something off like what i was able to do of course there are a few people before me who were not able to do it both way it could go both ways so for me it worked out great and i thought i i did many things which i never thought i would be able to do and that increased my confidence and it brought out the best uh, in everything um, in me from a technology leadership and all of those so if people believe you know they can't um, they can't sustain that they have to move out there is no reason to stay there and complain um, if you can't you can't then just you're not uh, uh, because if you the key is anywhere you go people have to be having a reasonable understanding of the mission and think about is this something i want to be part of if you are that's why i said even earlier you're not only an entrepreneurial journey on a day in and day out i know yes people for everyone you know you need money to run family and other things it's important but at the same time if you are if you are only in certain things for only for money then you have yeah. to seriously think to move out as fast as you can and go do something that you can at least be a little bit attached to and then you can yeah. if you become passionate about it awesome but if you can be a little bit attached to it then money is also part of it then it's fine but if money is the only reason then yeah your generally people's life will be miserable and uh, and jay so, so i have heard you know that most of the senior execs like uh, you used to sleep even in the tesla's offices because uh, the deadlines were so so same happened with you for in the three four years <laughs> yeah yeah i have done that yeah i've done that so uh, the first uh, as i said uh, we had a biggest goal the first mission impossible for me was building an erp in three months and i took you know I, i've known in my past life and oracle and others erp implementation took even at vmware took year to two years it's a massive project with hundreds of millions of dollars so i had to build in 3 months so there is no other way and literally for me i was in the critical path basically the goal was to build an erp version the first version and build a car on it so i had to do that there is no other way so i had to live and again thanks to my phenomenal team i used to be yeah there are times i have stayed in the office uh, there are times where i'll stay in the office till like 2 am then go home um just take a two or three hours of a quick nap and then i'll have a stand up meeting 7:30 am in the morning in the office because every minute became important literally we were in the critical path where if we, because it was a public company we were under the lens um and if we couldn't produce the car that will be on me and of course there are other things robotics and you know all of the things need to be set up manufacturing supply chain all of those but software was kind of enabling all of those so we had to um prepare uh, get it get it ready there is no other way it's kind of a do or die situation <clears throat> and uh, for the company so yes it was part of, part of the journey as i said if you if if you are not convinced on the mission you are trying to solve something important and big then it becomes tough and we for us i you know made it sure that i understand what are we trying to solve and if this is worth enough then we all put all of our effort and our team and everything and it was a very clear path where the first starting was like you know what this is crazy this is never going to happen we are all going to get fired to slowly thinking mindset about you know what okay if that is what going to happen if i'm going to go down i'm going to go down in flames we are going to do everything to give it a shot and if we can do it then at least we we are we are satisfied that we give gave everything so that was the approach we went ahead luckily we had we pulled it off um and we were able to produce the car the software was bug buggy and all kinds of problems were there but at the end of the day it accomplished the purpose and then we continued to grow and made it much more solid and now it's scaling and growing uh, globally and i just want to touch upon the last part of your journey at tesla 
what are the key things that you learned from osmosis or directly from elon while working closely with him <clears throat> yeah mm. one of the things is uh, you know that um, core purpose uh, he was very very strong so he went to he was thinking many times of fundamentals and abstract um, sometimes it was very tough for people around because people around in the sense i mean the leaders operational leaders including myself you know you need to go execute that he can be thinking abstract and say you know what um you you, you need to go solve it this way and this is the outcome right um so for example he would say something like you know what um customers should be able to buy a car with zero signatures okay it's a great outcome but end of the day it's not about we are not asking signatures there is a government regulation and requirement for signatures there is um, you know california law there is federal government his goal is thinking is right because his pro- his thinking process was for consumers making it easy so um, i think his, he was so objectively driven to his mission of um, solving a problem in the right way and that is something i learned um, and if you be go at it with conviction and uh, grit you absolutely will be able to not all the time you may be able to do 100% but even if you do uh, 80% it still brings massive value to everyone i think that is one second is um also come up with you know um smart solutions even pointers um to your uh, team to make sure that when you solve complex problems there will be there will be barriers he was not faced about anything um so i think that's something um i i learned come up with smart um solutions for many things right everything from technology problems to capital um, cash problems to all kinds of things so i think that is uh, another um thing i learned uh and just going at with the with the you know the, the drive um the highest level of drive to make things uh, make things happen um so yeah all of those uh, there are quite a quite a few uh, learnings i think the one of the important things i learned is you know consumer experience making sure that is the first point i said make sure that that is you have your objectives clear your goals clear and just go after it whatever uh, whatever it takes i think i'll say probably those are the core learnings so one thing which i personally wanted to ask you know because i have been an entrepreneur and um, elon pulled it off how do you you know do it when for a long time nobody believes in you and right uh, in his parallel company spacex 3 to 4 uh, initial launches crashed right and and the same similar effect you know because it's the same entrepreneur running two different set of company so he would bring because yeah, uh, entrepreneur is also an emotional person right is not yeah, a very exactly. objective yeah. robot I agree. he would bring the same kind of that he has failed there and people looking up to him with that kind of lens that exactly oh, that's a great great point uh, siddharth i think since uh, being an entrepreneur i think you understand it's not it's not easy you know um you're under phenomenal amount of stress um and that's why you know people make mistakes it's everyone is human even he makes mistakes and since he is so under the lens sometimes he could make mistakes you know while tweeting and while, so so i think the point is um it's about um it's about learning and uh, i think uh, evolution for him this is what i said there it's he's unique i mean there are leaders like that right you know in the past and historical from people who brought about some major transformation and major um changes at uh, you know uh, century level not even decades level right so some major uh, industry transformations um it is uh, yeah from that perspective he's uh, you know unique um he has brought in some huge huge changes that's why not everyone can but he has also created inspiration for so many people uh, right um so many people thought because world has become smaller with the internet with um being connected social and all of those now you learn about these great people almost instantly um 
So there, he created inspiration to so many people, young aspiring entrepreneurs that, you know, what people thought were impossible and uh, people only dream about many times. Sometimes even dreams, they think it's too big. And he thought, he showed to people that these things are possible. If you go at it, you can, you can make these things happen. So now it's creating a lot more inspired, you know, uh, engineers, entrepreneurs, so many other people. I think, uh, I think that's the most important thing. I don't know whether everyone can. I'm sure there is going to be maybe a few more people these uh, in the following maybe decades to come who will grow into um, similar. But uh, he's very, very unique uh, in that perspective. And um, that's why he's accomplishing things that, uh, you know, many many couldn't do for uh, decades and, and i think you know what what you are doing is uh, also very very aspirational because at techion you are trying to you could have picked the easy problem to solve but you took an industry which is hundreds of years old and oems are like uh, you know if you talk about them fords and Fiat's hundreds of years. They control the industry. Industry doesn't, you know, no one doesn't control them. They control the industry. So bringing change in how they work for the benefit of the end consumer is as aspirational, you know. So yeah, thank you, I'm, 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 I'm rooting it. for. Take, take <laughs> thank you, Siddharth. Really, really, uh, really appreciated that. Yes, yes, we are, we are super committed, extraordinarily excited. We are working hard. Uh, definitely, we'll we will grow. We will scale. A um, lot more value to bring to this industry. And uh, as I said, um, yes, it was a tough journey to start with, but I think we're in a great place. And now the industry has embraced us so well, and we've gotten gotten support again. Thanks to all of the partners, right? Even the our investors uh, from General Motors to Nissan, Renault, Mitsubishi to BMW to FCA. Uh, I think it's been great. And dealers, multiple dealers in the country, uh, Joe Serra from Capital. I think people who have trusted Advent us. Um, I think we we collaborate, and they, we, so far we brought in a lot of value to everyone, including our customers to start with, our employees, and our um, shareholders. And yeah, I think we'll we'll work hard to continue continue that growth and keep it sustaining and very long term de- decades to come. And and one of the thing the most one of the most brilliant move you know which I consider you have done in the other Techion team I should have said and done it is bringing these uh, stakeholders together on the same cap table like where they wouldn't have sat across a single boardroom because like, they are fiercely competitive. You have made. Them- Vested in your success, first of all, and uh, and I think in another universe they would have see each other across the same <laughs> cap table or or board room. Yeah, thank you, uh, Siddharth. Again, that's a validation of what we are solving. Again, thanks to them to be pragmatic about these things, because when there is a common industry problem you are solving. These are the proof more than anything for me. Honestly, dollars, money, yes, it's all good. Others could have given the same. But them giving the money and being part of it is a extraordinary validation for someone like me and my team to um, just say, you know, you're solving the right industry problem, not just in the problem for me, problem for someone else, but it's an industry problem, which is great for me. I'm definitely grateful for that. Jim, one last part of your journey, which I touched upon the podcast before concluding it, is your journey as an angel investor. Which companies you have been part of, if you can share some of them? Uh, yeah. And, uh, mm, yes. Uh, I, you pick? Mm-hmm. See, I've uh, invested in quite a few, quite a few companies from very early days. Uh, you know. Um, I was a um, seed investor. Uh, I don't know if I remember all the names i've invested as i said like 25 26 companies some are doing well some are um doing okay some doesn't exist <laughs> so uh a company called as usher uh, they just raised their series b um i think they are in the uh, rpi um uh, automation um uh, robotics and automation and uh, let me see and uh, that's uh, where um there was a company called as Calicom. Um, 
and then uh, there is another company. Mm, uh, let me see. I've invested in uh, even early investor. I've been invested in secondary shares through funds in Lyft, um, Palantir, which just went public uh, recently. And then uh, in India, I invested in Arthur Energy, the um, electric, uh, ba in Bangalore, right? Electric bike, electric scooter. Them. And then um, I did a small investment in, in, even in Factor Daily, uh, which is the media uh, in early days. Um, let me see. What else? Um, um yeah i think these are some of the companies that come to my mind i have a list of portfolio i don't actively spend time with uh, but again when they reach out for help if i can give some pointers then i will uh, i do thank you so much jeff for sharing your journey experience wisdom you know everything so candidly i think uh, i have learned a lot i hope entrepreneurs and those who aspire to be entrepreneurs learn a lot from from this podcast which have you have shared so candidly you're most welcome uh, siddharth great conversation and thanks for giving me an opportunity to share my uh, my experience and definitely all the best uh, to you and all of your listeners and um, entrepreneurs aspiring entrepreneurs and everyone have a wonderful uh, upcoming months and uh, hopefully our 2021 will be phenomenal